the uh, parent liaison for Tringa Basin. And my coworkers here with us, um, Laura, if you would like to present yourself. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Hi, good morning, parents. Um, again, my name is Laura Rios. I'm student recruitment manager here with Trinity Basin Preparatory. It is a pleasure to have you all here. Um, we're happy to see that you have joined us this morning. We have great topics for you today, and we hope that this is very useful um, for you and your students as well. Okay, I just have a, <clears throat> a couple of announcements to make. First of all, if you would um, sign in in the chat box, you can do it um, to myself or to Laura Rios, if you could just sign in. And for the month of November, um, we'll be having several um, COVID-19 vaccine clinics in some of our campuses. At the moment, if anyone is interested, um, please sign up for it. And um, you'll be seeing like additional information coming out in the newsletter um, and also on our website. This event is open to the whole community. Anyone can come, um, you just have to sign up. And we continue to have our food pantry at our Jefferson campus. Uh, for this month, registration has closed, but we will reopen again starting sometime next week for the month of um, November. Um, this event is currently only for our Dallas TBP families. I know that Panola and Mesquite campuses also have food pantries. So if you're interested in, in if you're in that area and you're interested, please um, don't hesitate to reach out to your campuses for assistance. And also um, for the month of November, we'll be having a free household item distribution at our Panola campus on Saturday, November the 20th. This event will take place from 9 a.m. to noon. This is on a first come first serve basis. Um, this event is only for our TBP and Clayton youth families. Only two persons per family will be allowed to come in and choose two items. I believe this event has already been posted on our newsletter and website. Please see the flyer for additional information. And today our topic is bully prevention. Um, our person that will be uh, um, presenting this is Holly Vasquez. She's our counseling and family engagement coordinator. And um, um, this morning we also have Grant Holliber here um, to talk to us um, about resilience. So um, Holly, please take it away and let me Stop sharing here. I'm sorry, Ms. Gomez. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Ms. Vasquez. Before you get started, just want to mention something to um, parents really quick. Um, parents that are already connected, um, just to let you know, today's session, um, it is the English session. Um, and tomorrow we will have the Spanish session at the same time from 9 to 10. So if we have any Spanish speaking parents that have joined us, um, we are having this session in English today. And then tomorrow we'll be having the Spanish. Um, thank you. And Ms. Vasquez, you can go ahead and get started. Hey. All right, Julia, if you can take it off of yours. Let's see. What am I doing wrong? Um, you can just click uh, stop sharing. Um, and Laura, if you, might if you can enable me to share mine. Um, I oh, there it goes. Be able to now. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I got it. There we go. All right. Can y'all see mine? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is Holly Vasquez. I am the Counseling and Family Engagement Coordinator for Trinity Basin. I've been with the district for a couple of years now. I was first a middle school counselor at the Pafford campus. Uh, love working with the kids. Bullying and bullying prevention is kind of one of my passions that I have, uh, you know, working in education and working with kids. I feel very strongly about every kid being able to go to school and be happy and be safe. 
And so I was really excited when Julia and Laura, you know, asked me about presenting today. And I said, absolutely. And then Grant Halliburton Foundation is with us as well. And so I will be introducing them later on this morning, but they're going to come in and talk about resiliency. Because when you talk about bullying prevention, you've also got to talk about the resiliency. Those two things kind of go hand in hand. So those are the two big subjects that we're going to be talking about with y'all today. Okay, so I am, let me see. I'm going to go ahead and get this in presentation mode. All right, so here we go. We've got bullying 101 and building resiliency. We're going to talk about the difference between conflict and bullying because they are not the same. We're going to talk about how to recognize warning signs, and then we're going to segue into the Grant Halliburton Foundation and talk about how to help your child build resiliency. Oh, sorry, I am... There we go, having some computer issues. So let's talk about bullying in the year of 2021 currently. Bullying is, unfortunately, it's a bit of a common problem in school age children. Um, about 28% of students in grades six through 12, so that's our middle school and high school ages, uh, report being bullied. 30% admit to bullying others. 70% of kiddos say that they have witnessed it, and 16% of our high school students were cyberbullied. And we're going to talk more about cyberbullying later on. We're going to talk specifically about what that is and what that looks like. The main forms of bullying that we have, there's, there's four recognized forms. So we've got physical bullying, verbal, social, emotional, and cyberbullying. So examples of physical bullying, uh, it's, it's kind of like what we think about or what we've seen in the movies or seen on TV, hitting, pushing, you know, if you have a kid coming up and knocking someone's books out of their arms, if they're tripping someone on purpose, that's all examples of physical bullying. Verbal bullying is teasing, name calling, and this is where we also get the comments about anything having to do with race or sexual orientation, like our uh, gay and lesbian students any kind of mean comments that falls underneath the umbrella of verbal bullying. Social emotional bullying is probably one that I think I have seen the most in my years as a middle school counselor. So this is where you basically have a group of kids who will gang up on another student. They might be spreading rumors, they might be gossiping, sometimes they'll exclude that person from their friend group. They will convince other people to stop being friends with that student. Um, it's a lot of manipulation. That's what we see with social emotional bullying. And then we have cyber bullying. And this has really unfortunately kind of come up in recent years. Uh, cyber bullying is any sort of harassment via texting or social media. It can be words, it can be pictures, could be text messages, private messages. Um, sometimes we see people creating fake profiles, pretending to be someone that they're not, um, ganging up on another person in a chat room, posting about them on a website, threatening them via the internet or their phone. That all falls underneath the umbrella of cyberbullying. So cyberbullying is on the rise. Um, we are starting to see that more frequently than any other types of bullying. And I really think the reason for that is because smartphones are just so prevalent right now. Every kid has one, every adult has one, and social media and online gaming have really been on the rise. Um, and so smartphones are great, right? Like we can do a lot with them and they're fun and it's easy to get information, but, but smartphones really and truly do enable cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is also considered to be a little bit more severe because it is 24 seven. So, you know, parents, you know, most of us, when we were growing up, if you were being bullied at school, you were only bullied at school. When you went home, you were at home. Now, when our kids go home, they still have their phone, they still have social media, they can continue to be bullied all through the evening, all during the night, all during the weekend. And so it's the kind of bullying that we say is 24 seven because the kids really can't get a break. You know, used to be if somebody was picking on you at school, you, you had to worry about it during school hours, Monday through Friday. The cyberbullying is a little bit different. It's a little bit more severe. 
some risk factors for bullying. Basically, if kids are seen as being different, and that could be any sort of category, if um, they're really overweight, if they have a difference in sexuality, uh, transgender, if they even have a different sense of style, Sometimes I've seen it to where it's a money issue. If you have a child that, you know, others think is either really rich or really poor, anything that's an extreme difference, um, those students are more at risk. Students that are seen as weak or unable to defend themselves, um, students that struggle with depression or anxiety, they usually have low self-esteem, and that kind of ties back into being unable to defend yourself. Students who are loners, if you will, if they have few or no friends, those that don't socialize well with other students, and then any kiddos that have intellectual or developmental disabilities, all of those kids are more at risk for being a victim of bullying. The roles during a bullying situation. So this is something I would really go over with my students. I wanted them to understand that there are three roles in bullying. There's not two. It's not just the bully and the target. There's also a bystander. So I think we all kind of know, like we're pretty familiar with, you know, the role of a bully and the role of the target or the victim, but the bystander is actually very, very important. Those are your witnesses, the people that are observing the bullying going on. And we say that bystander, bystanders can either be passive or active. So a passive bystander is just kind of watching what's going on and just letting it happen. They're not intervening, they're not doing anything. An active bystander is coming in and actually trying to do something, stop the bully, get the, the victim away, get them out of the situation. So bullying versus conflict, um, this is probably one of the most popular questions that I get asked by both students and adults, because I have a lot, like I would have a lot of kiddos come in and say, well, miss, I'm being bullied. Well, we would sit down and talk about the situation and come to find out they're not actually being bullied. There's just conflict. Um, TBP actually has set criteria to determine whether or not a situation is truly bullying. And so these are the four criteria that a situation has to meet. There has to be either a single significant act or a pattern of acts. There has to be an imbalance of power. That one is huge. So an imbalance of power means um, like size. If you have an eighth grader picking on a sixth grader, that's an imbalance of power. Numbers, if you have a group of kids picking on one kid, that's an imbalance of power. You have to have some imbalance for it to be considered bullying. It's gotta be one of the four categories, physical, verbal, social, emotional, or cyber. And then it has to basically be severe enough, persistent enough that it is impacting the daily life every day of the victim. Bullying is not an argument between friends, a disagreement. Um, sometimes I would have two friend groups that would be going at it between each other. That's not bullying. That's mutual mean behavior, but not considered bullying. Um, if I have two friends and they get in a fight, they just decide that they're not going to be each other's friend anymore. That's not bullying. That's just conflict. So parents, here are some things for you to look for. You know, if you're ever wondering, if you feel like something might be off with your child, if you have a concern, um, some things to look for if you think your child might be being bullied. I'm just gonna go through a few of, few of the more major ones. Um, anytime you have a kid with unexplainable injuries, if your child can't tell you why they have a bruise, if they can't tell you why they have ripped clothing, that could be a warning sign. Uh, a kiddo who is frequently ill, they always have a headache, they always have a stomach ache, they always feel sick, they just don't want to be at school, they're always asking to stay home. That's another big sign. And then anytime that we see a drastic change, that could be a change in grades, it could be a change in eating habits, maybe a kid loses their appetite, it could be a change in sleeping, they can't sleep anymore, they're having insomnia. Those are some of the bigger warning signs that I tell parents to be on the lookout for. So parents, if you ever think that your kiddo is being bullied, the first thing that I would encourage you to do is to please go talk to the school staff, especially the teacher. 
The teachers are the ones who see the most. They are with your kid every single day. A lot of time we have people that just go straight to a principal and that's great, but the principal is not with your child every day. It's the teacher. So we really want you to ask the teacher first, ask questions, you know, ask what things they have seen, ask what observations they have made. Uh, from there, the next best person to go to is the school counselor. You know, TVP is a little bit special. Our school counselors are really, really involved with our kids because we're a little bit smaller. We're a smaller district. And so like I always knew all of my students. I knew them by name. I knew what class they were in. I knew their social situations. So the school counselor is another really good resource for you. Talk with your student. Be an active listener. Um, your kid may not tell you right away if they're having a problem. Keep giving them opportunities and just be there to listen. Don't judge. Just try to, to you know, make sure that they know that you're there. We also have an anonymous bullying report link on our main TBP website. So if you scroll all the way down to the bottom on the website, there will be a link on the right hand side that says anonymous bullying report and it will take you to a Google form and you are always welcome to fill that out. And then finally, I always tell parents remain calm and just wait for the facts. Sometimes it's what you think it is, sometimes it's not, and it's totally different. So keep in mind that, you know, the school staff, we're, we're going to get to the bottom of it. We're going to talk to both parties. We're going to get the whole picture, and then we're going to present the facts to you. TBP has a zero tolerance stance on bullying. Zero tolerance. We do not allow bullying on our campus. If we do find evidence that there is a situation that is actually bullying, we take action. There are a variety of actions that we can take. Sometimes, you know, parents think that that automatically means that, you know, a student's going to be expelled. That's not necessarily the case. There are different options that principals can choose from. But if there is a really, really severe case of bullying, then um, removal from the school is something that can occur. The steps in an alleged bullying case, just so that you know if your child is ever in this situation, um, a parent or a student has to report the bullying activity. So that, that's actually very crucial because a lot of the time I'll talk to a kid and they're like, well, I've been bullied for months. And I say, well, who did you tell? And they're like, well, I'm like, did you tell an adult? Did you tell your teacher? Did you, you haven't told me, this is the first time hearing of it. Um, that is super important. But, you know, the minute that a kid's having a problem, the minute that they feel like they're being bullied, we really need them to go tell somebody to be proactive because we can't help them if we don't know. After that, a school counselor will screen the initial bullying report and we'll go through that criteria and that checklist to see if it meets our bullying criteria. And from there, the principals open an investigation. We are very fair in the way that we do investigations. We always get both sides. We get statements from both parties. And then we also collect witness statements. That's very, very crucial in making sure that we get an accurate picture of what's going on. After the investigation concludes, the principal will determine what kind of interventions or consequences will be assigned. They might collaborate with the counselor or with the teachers. They're going to document everything that happened, and then they're going to update the parents on both sides. So they will communicate with the parents of both the bully and the parents of the victim. Okay, so now let's talk resiliency, and we're going to get ready to segue into Grant Halliburton. So we're gonna talk about what it is and why it's so important. Resiliency is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Any of us that have been around for a hot minute know stuff happens, right? Unfortunately, life is not, it's not butterflies and rainbows and there's gonna be hard situations. There's gonna be mean people as an adult I have to deal with mean people, you know, more than I think I should have to. There's going to be unfair situations. There's always going to be something. And so as adults and as educators and as parents and guardians, we have a responsibility to help our kids learn to bounce back. Now, does that mean that if your child's being bullied that I'm saying they just need to suck it up and get over it? That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they, they need to learn that, okay, I had something happen. 
It wasn't fun. It wasn't a good experience, but I'm going to learn how to move forward. And I'm not going to let this one experience determine the rest of my future. That's a really big message with resiliency. We might have a really tough experience. It might be really painful, but it's not going to determine the outcome of my life. Okay. So with that being said, I'm going to introduce Miss Jessica Look. She is with the Grant Halliburton Foundation, and this foundation is really very special. I did a lot of research before I connected with them and asked them to come on and speak to y'all, and I was very impressed with their mission and their purpose. They were created in 2006 in the memory of a young man who actually really struggled with mental health and suicide, and sometimes those two things go together with bullying. And so this foundation, they do a lot for the community. They do a lot of education. They provide presentations both to youth and to adults. They have training, they have resources. Um, their whole goal is to promote better mental health and suicide prevention. And they have a, an entire presentation for you on building resilience. And I was like, that is perfect. That's what we're all about. We're coming off of a pandemic with COVID. We need that. We need our kids to learn how to have some grit and, and learn how to kind of come back from when life throws us curveballs. So Miss Jessica, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I want to thank you so much for coming on today. We really appreciate you being here. And I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, let me see if I can find my um, PowerPoint here now. Okay, thank y'all so much for um, letting me talk to you for a few minutes this morning. Um, as she said, my name is Jessica Luck, and I am a Thrive Strategy and Education Manager for Grant Halliburton Foundation. And Grant Halliburton Foundation is a Dallas-based nonprofit that works to pro promote better adolescent mental health and prevent youth suicide. And so as part of the education team, I have the opportunity to speak with parents, uh, counselors, uh, just school districts, nonprofits about all aspects of youth mental health. And I just want to thank you and Trinity Basin for partnering with us and making youth mental health a priority on your campuses this year. So we all know that navigating this pandemic has not been easy and it has caused toxic stress for many of us, including our kids. The ability to bounce back after stress is really shaped by three factors. So first, it's just your body's natural ability to handle stress, and that looks different for everyone. Second, it's your access to protection from stress. And third, it's the opportunities one has to recover from the stress. And so today, we're really going to talk about that important middle piece and that is building those protective factors to help with resilience. So welcome to Bounce Back, Building Resilience in Children and Teens. We're gonna talk about a lot of things related to resilience, but we'll break it down into three topics. So first, what is resilience? Well, talking about resilience isn't new, but the term has replaced previous buzzwords like grit and growth mindset. Second, we'll learn about the ABCs of resilience, which focus on how our thoughts and our beliefs can really affect the outcomes in our lives. And then third, we will look at the building blocks of resilience. And these are based on the seven Cs developed by Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg, who is a respected expert in this field. So what is resilience? Well, resilience is not the absence of distress or difficulty. Resilience is the ability to adapt and grow following the adversity. We all want to raise healthy, happy children who lead charmed lives and never experience a disappointment, a struggle, a failure, or a loss. 
If it were up to us, our kids would all get straight A's, it would make great friend choices, and they would never make a bad decision. But the truth is that we can't protect our children from every disappointment or struggle. And even if we could, would that really be good for them? Our job as parents is to help our children and teens build resilience so that they can move successfully and independently into the future. We can't take all the hard things away, but we can help to foster resilience. So what does resilience look like? Resilience is not ignoring emotions such as sadness, grief, or anger. No one likes to feel those negative emotions, but bottling those feelings up won't help. In fact, we know that doing that can actually cause high blood pressure, memory loss, low self-esteem, and can lead to anxiety and depression. So we need to help kids learn how to work through those tough emotions. Resilience is using healthy coping skills to manage difficult emotions and really understanding the difference between healthy coping strategies and negative ones. Resilience is not denying help and putting pressure on yourself or telling yourself just to get over it and move on. We want our children to know that it's brave to ask for help. Everyone goes through hard times and that is okay. Resilience is knowing when to ask for help. It is courageous to ask for help when you feel like you are stuck or you're struggling and it's okay to give yourself some grace. We want our kids to know that. Resilience is not telling yourself to get over it and move on. Sometimes as adults, we are quick to dismiss a child who's struggling, especially if the struggle seems like something really small to us. Um, and so sometimes we give them the message that they should just like pull themselves up by their bootstraps and soldier on, but that seemingly small struggle might be a big deal to them. So we need to really help them learn how to work through it. And resilience is being patient and kind to yourself. Everyone faces challenges in their lives. Um, and sometimes it's okay to not feel like you're okay. So we all need resilience to get through adversity. Every child has a unique story. And although their stories will be different, everyone has some type of adversity they have faced or are currently facing. They might be experiencing school stress or difficult friendships an illness or a loss, or they're just readjusting to life after COVID. But what we want them to know is that they can get past it. They can grow from these experiences, that they can deal with adversity in a healthy way that does not impede your success in life. So just think about where your children are in terms of adversity and just meet them there. And if you have a child who is struggling, it is okay because resilience can be built. And so that's the good news. We can strengthen resiliency at any age. It is never too early or too late to build resilience. From a toddler, teen to young adult, we can all strengthen resilience. We can take specific steps to help develop resiliency in children. And we will spend a lot of time talking about those steps when we look at our seven C's model. And we can model how to handle stress in healthy ways. Remember, when we're talking about our youth, more is caught than taught. So we need to uh, make sure that we are serving as a good example for our children. So according to the American Psychological Association, resilience is not um, a trait that people either have or do not have. It involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that can be learned and developed in anyone. We all have hard things going on in our lives. Sometimes they're small, sometimes they're big. Sometimes it's something you never imagined you'd have to go through. However, it's how you respond. It's your reaction. That is how, what will determine how your life story will develop. And this leads us to the ABCs of resilience. And so there is a common misconception that adversity will lead straight to a consequence. And in this case, when we say consequence, we just mean an outcome. So one thing happens and then this happens because of it. We know that our children are going to face adversity and we know that there are going to be outcomes or consequences, but we need to have a better understanding of how these th two things um, work together because there's an important missing piece to this puzzle. So let's consider a student who is struggling. Uh, maybe they're struggling um, in class with a friend or maybe with a skill or a concept. 
If they don't understand the connection between adversity and resilience, they might just assume that going through a hard thing is going to end badly. It's gonna end with them being frustrated, with them getting angry, with them failing. In other words, it's going to end up with a negative consequence. But the truth is that the outcomes are not always the same. <clears throat> there can be at least two different outcomes. Either somebody becomes angry and frustrated and they give up, or the situation works out through cooperation, hard work, and most importantly, a positive attitude. So success can be achieved. And that is the consequence we want our children uh, to know uh, if they are struggling. We want them to turn that struggle into a learning experience so that they can move <clears throat> on and they're more equipped for the next challenge. So what makes the difference in those two? Well, people react differently to the exact same challenges um, due to that middle missing piece. And sorry, it's so squished, but it says beliefs because between um, adversity and consequence, um, what you believe can really affect that outcome. And so the fact is our beliefs are shaped by our thinking. And we can think about it in terms of a coach versus a critic mindset. So it's like we have two very different voices telling us how to think about things. The coach offers con constructive criticism. It tells you um, that you've messed up, but it also encourages you to use that as a building block and to do better and to progress or to meet a goal. The coach has a positive viewpoint. The critic, on the other hand, is negative. It's that voice that tells you you've messed up and it's intent on making you feel blame, shame, and insecurity because of it. So the coach builds us up and the critic tears us down. And we have a choice of what voice we're going to listen to. Um, are we going to think positively and say, I can do better, I can succeed? Or are we going to say, I'm a failure and I'm never going to amount to anything? Well, if you ask young people which voice is louder, they will almost always say the critic. So how can we help empower our children and our teens to believe their inner coach instead? So here's the thing, you have a key role here. We know that respected adults have the most impact and influence on our youth. And I know sometimes we think that they only care what their peer group says, but truthfully, it only takes one caring, trusted adult to believe in a child to change their entire path. Also, your beliefs about a child can shape the beliefs about themselves. We internalize things we hear and we start to believe them to be true. So if a child gets a label by an adult, like they're, they're a bully, they're the class clown, they're lazy, then many times they're gonna live up or down to uh, what you believe about them because they do, you know, they live up and down to our expectations. So what expectations are we setting for our children? You know, what beliefs do we have about them? So if you as a respected adult in their lives believe they can do better, a lot of times they will start to believe in themselves as well. So we've talked about how mindset and a child's belief system are really important, but don't forget you have a lot of influence here. So how can we help children and teens bounce back from challenges and manage stress? Well, we can use these building blocks of resilience based on the seven C's model by Dr. Kenneth Ginsburg. And so what are the seven C's? They are competence, Confidence, connection, character, contribution, coping, and control. So we'll spend just a few minutes talking about um, each of these and learning how to foster it. And then I'll present a couple of reflection questions so that you can think about what you're currently doing in each of these areas and think about things you might want to improve on. So this is our first and most important of the seven C's. It's really the foundation on which all the other, all the other um, C's are built. And this is competence. 
So Dr. Ginsburg describes competence as the ability to handle situations and reach goals. And competence is acquired through actual experience. So if a child puts the work in, whether it's in academics or a sport or creative activity like theater or art or music, they will gain competence. And it's derived from a wide range of achievements from almost invisible steps to major leaps. And so many years ago, I was a first grade teacher. And one of the best things about teaching first grade is just getting to see that like miracle moment when they learn to read independently. Well, that's a major leap, but it was achieved through months and months of hard work, repetition and practice, you know, from learning the letters to learning the sounds, um, phonemic awareness, phonological awareness, all of those things um, came together, you know, to make that that big leap into reading. So just remember that sometimes those steps seem invisible, but they're all adding up to competence. So we really wanna help our children focus on their individual strengths. Every child is good at something. So let's find out what that is and let's use that strength to help build them up. And we really want to acknowledge what they do well, not just their mistakes. It is so easy to point out mistakes, but when you must correct a mistake, um, and of course you will, um, try to make, uh, try to focus on the action, not the person. And then let's also be intentional with our compliments as well. Let's try to catch our kids being good. And then we want to allow for safe mistakes versus um, overprotective parenting. And so you might be concerned about the idea of safe mistakes, um, but when you can, just give them the space to be able to make small mistakes and self-correct because that will help them to grow. We live in a time of helicopter parenting and I am totally guilty of that myself. Um, a few years ago, I decided to leave teaching to become a stay-at-home mom and I did everything for my oldest daughter. When, her, when she was in third, fourth, and fifth grade. Um, I told her about every due date. I told her about every deadline. If she forgot an assignment, um, I would run it up to the school. If she had an issue with a teacher or a student, I would be on the phone and I'd be emailing. And I truly thought I deserved like a mom of the year trophy. I mean, I thought I was doing a great job. But then she got to middle school and the teacher said, don't call us, don't email us, do not turn in late assignments for your students. And they kind of shut all the overprotective parents down. Well, guess what happened? Two weeks into school, she got her first zero. And I got notice after notice of missing and late assignments. Because I had never let her make those safe mistakes for herself. She didn't know how to keep up with her schoolwork on her own. So sometimes as hard as it is, we need to like take a step back and just allow our kids to figure things out for themselves. So our competence reflection questions are, how can we help uh, build authentic skills that make youth competent in the real world? Again, we wanna help children focus on their individual strengths um, so they can work from a position of recognizing their own strengths. And how can we praise in a way that notices effort more than it rewards the product? So this really goes back to developing a growth mindset. We wanna praise the process, not the person. So instead of just saying, you are so smart, you could say, wow, great job on that assignment. I can tell a lot of work went into that. So be specific and be intentional. Competence really takes an investment of time, practice, exposure, and exploration. And it teaches a child that by doing something, studying or practicing um, over time, they can master it. And it really lays the groundwork for many of the other C's, especially our next one, which is competence. So competence is rooted in competence. It's not the same as self-esteem. It's not the result of superficial praise or being just told that they're special. The trophy culture does not build confidence. It doesn't allow them to earn recognition based on their own actual individual ability. 
So confidence really is the solid belief in your own abilities. And that's what creates um, the willingness to try new things. And so, oh, I'm sorry. So my oldest daughter, the one who I ruined for sixth grade has been involved in children's theater since she was like six years old. And she just started out in the background and then she moved on to have like one or two lines. But now she consistently gets, um, you know, one of the leading roles in the production. She has developed competence in this area. Well, a couple of years ago, she decided she wanted to audition for a hip hop dance crew. Well, she had only taken hip hop for a year so I thought this is not going to end well, but she was very confident um, because she was already competent in this other area. It gave her a confidence to try something new. She did end up making it. Was she the best hip hop dancer? No, but she knew that, um, that if she worked hard um, that she could get better. So we really want to see the best in our kids so that they can see the best in themselves. Um, exploration is important, but it's good to develop core competencies. Remember, everyone is good at something. Let's find out what our kids are good at, especially those who might st struggle academically. And let's use those strengths to build them up. And we want to expect the best qualities in our kids. And I'm not talking about academic achievements, um, things like fairness, integrity, kindness, because remember, they will live up or down to our expectations. We want to praise our kids honestly. Kids know when they're receiving an empty compliment. We really want to treat them as young people learning to navigate the world, not as incapable children. When I decided to take all responsibility away from my daughter by doing everything for her, what I was really telling her is that I thought she was incapable of handling school on her own. So we really need to have confidence in our children so that they can have confidence in themselves. So how can we catch youth when they are doing the right thing and acknowledge it? So my absolute least favorite teacher duty when I was teaching was locker duty. It was the worst because there was a stretch of eighth grade lockers outside of my classroom. It was my job to monitor, monitor them between classes and after school. And it was only for five minutes at a time, but I dreaded those five minutes. I would stand out there and I would catch them doing everything wrong. And I was like a broken record, close your locker, don't slam your locker, pick up your trash, don't push your neighbor. It was so exhausting. But looking back, what if I had taken those five minutes to catch them being good? What if I had complimented the child who picked up the book his neighbor dropped? or ask politely to get to his locker instead of pushing everybody out of the way. We need to find those times, even if it's small amount of time to catch our kids being good. And how can we avoid instilling shame in our youth? So as adults, we are constantly correcting and pointing out mistakes. But remember, if a child has a critic mindset, all of those mistakes are tied to shame and insecurity. So. Let's be intentional about pointing out the positives more than the negatives with our kids. So we've talked about competence and confidence, and this leads us to my favorite C connection. So humans are wired for connection and the Centers for Disease Control has found that connect connectedness and sense of belonging are the strongest protective factors when it comes to youth suicide. Attachment expert Louis Cozzolino says that as humans, relationships are our natural habitat. We all need to feel connected to others. So connection really means they have that solid sense of security that leads to strong values and helps to prevent seeking unhealthy alternatives. So kids need strong connections in four primary areas. And the CDC has identified these as the most important points of connection for a child in this order. So first, it's strong family ties. And this does not mean that they have to be close to every member of their family, but they do need at least one family member that they know loves them unconditionally and can, will stand by them no matter what. Kids need to feel connected at school. They need to walk through the doors of their school and feel like they belong. there. 
not because of their grades, not because of their athletics. Making strong connections and genuine connections with their students is extremely important. They need positive peer relationships. Students, again, they don't have to have a huge peer group, but they do need at least one friend that cares about them. So if you see a child who does not have that connection, let's try to find ways to help get them connected. And then they also need to feel connected to their community. And this could be through church. It could be through a youth group. It could be through club sports. It could be through a volunteer opportunity. And so as you can see, we're kind of starting with the closest connections and moving out um, to form those layers, those protective layers around our kids. When students are part of a community, like a class or a team or a club, they learn that they aren't alone. And then if they do struggle, they learn how to um, develop solutions to those problems. And again, we wanna remember that a connected child is a protected child. So our connection reflections are, how do we build um, a sense of physical safety and emotional security within our homes? You know, are we making sure that our children know that home is a safe place? And how connected is my child to family in the broader world? Again, when children go through hard times, it's extremely important that they know they have a community of people surrounding them who care about them. Now let's look at the importance of building character. <clears throat> so young people need a clear understanding of right and wrong um, in order to make wise choices, to contribute to the world, and to become strong adults. Uh, a person can be very competent, confident, and deeply connected, but still not be prepared to thrive. And so in his book, Dr. Ginsburg gives an example of a competent young woman named Renee who learned to do things on her own because her parents weren't able to be very involved in her life. And she was very confident in herself and her skills. And she made some really strong connections with a group of girls. And these girls were there for her. They had her back. They were like her family. Um, and she felt very secure in those connections. But that group of girls turned out to be a gang. And she was missing that one C, which was character. She didn't know right from wrong. And she didn't realize that, realize that the choices that she was making would compromise her integrity and really lead her down a bad path. So children can have competence, confidence, and connections but without that character piece, um, you know, it can really impact the way they look at the world and the way they interact with people and it can affect their relationships that they build. So we really wanna help young people understand how their behaviors affect others. And we wanna allow youth to consider right versus wrong and help them look beyond immediate satisfaction or selfish needs. We know that youth do not have a fully developed prefrontal cortex and that they can't see the long-term effects of their decisions, which is why we as the adults in their lives need to help guide them sometimes. Our character reflection questions are, how can we help youth recognize themselves as caring people? Again, let's catch them being good and let's praise them for it. And how can we help them understand how their behavior affects others and teach empathy? We aren't born understanding empathy and we must teach our children how to see things from other perspectives. A child who lacks empathy could be seen as rude or inappropriate, but lacking empathy is a skill deficit. It is not a behavior problem. And that brings us to contribution. So contribution provides kids with a sense of, pur pur sense of purpose. It can positively motivate them. It helps them realize the world is a better place because they're in it and um, helps them believe they have the power to positively impact their world. And we know that helping others makes it easier for us to seek help when needed. And being willing to ask for help is a big part of being resilient. So we really wanna help our kids understand that there are many people who don't have what they need in terms of human contact, freedoms, money, and security. And we wanna discuss how they can make positive contributions to help change other circumstances. We really wanna teach and model 
generosity and serving others. So for a child or teenager who's trying to figure out who they are in the world um, and what their purpose is, serving others and seeing the adults in their lives serve others really can be a powerful thing. And so we can look at it um, in terms of a see, care, do model. So you see a need, you care about it, and you figure out what you can do to help. Um, and so this is an example of Marley Diaz. And so when Marley was 11, she noticed that there were no main characters in her school library that looked like her. And so she wanted to raise awareness. And so she started a book drive to collect a thousand books featuring black female protagonists. Well, she has far exceeded her goal with over 13,000 books and counting. She's been featured on countless shows. She's written a book. She was named on the Forbes 30 to watch under 30 list. Um, now, will all of our kids be Marley? No, but showing them examples of other children or teens who saw a need and then made a difference can help inspire them to do the same, even if it's just in a small way. So how can we convey that we believe our youth can make the world a better place? And are we creating opportunities for our kids to co contribute to their community? And if we are, have we seen them grow as a result? Our next C is coping. And so young people with positive coping skills are better prepared to deal with life's challenges and they are less likely to turn to unhealthy behaviors when they feel stressed. And so we know that the CDC says that when someone takes their own life, more than half of the time, it's because they did not have strong coping and problem solving skills to help them work through those hard times. So we really want to understand, um, you know, how coping impacts their resiliency. This is something we can all work on in ourselves um, and our children to help build resilience. So I mentioned toxic stress earlier, and that is extended stress that can eventually wear on the body and the brain. So toxic stress can weaken the immune system. It can cause anxiety and depression. And for kids, it can affect their ability to self-regulate and can cause them to become more reactive in situations. So we really wanna teach our kids healthy ways to deal with their stress so it doesn't get to this point. So we really wanna help our kids put um, situations into perspective. Uh, we wanna teach them healthy coping skills and stress relievers like learning how to take a break from a stressful situation or a person. Um, finding a creative outlet, getting some exercise, or just connecting with someone they trust to talk through their problems. And then most importantly, remember more is caught than taught. So we wanna make sure that we are modeling those positive coping strategies as well. So reflection questions are, um, you know, are we guiding our kids to develop those positive coping strategies? And how can we encourage self-expression and healthy outlets? And again, are we as the adults um, you know, in the home modeling those positive coping strategies daily? This leads us to our final C, control. When young people realize that they have the power to control the outcomes of their decisions and their, their actions, they are more likely to believe in their ability to bounce back. So when you are a child or a teen, so many things feel out of your control. There are adults telling you what to do and how to do it all day long. So if you give a child just a little bit of control, it allows them to take ownership and it allows them to go back to some of the other things we've talked about, like confidence. And they start to believe, you know, I can handle this on my own. I know how to do this. Now, we know that trust has to be built too. So if you have a child who is making very poor decisions, you can't just give them all the control in the world, but you can allow them um, to learn to take some small steps towards gaining, um, gaining some of that control and independence. So we wanna help our kids trust their own decision-making skills. If we're always second guessing them and making decisions for them, they start to think that we don't trust them you know, I make a decision, then mom says, why don't you do this instead? You know, sometimes we just need to coach them through it um, and take a step back so that they can learn. We don't want to hand out privileges lightly or use bribes. Freedoms should be earned. 
Um, and they should know that if they don't live up to expectations you've set, um, you know, they know that the privilege will be taken away, right? And they'll understand why it has been taken away. And we also need to know when to take control and when to avoid a needless power struggle. So we can think about it like a teen learning how to drive. You can let them learn through some small mistakes, like maybe rolling through a stop sign or hitting a curb. But at some point, if they're gonna drive you off the bridge, you're gonna to need to take control of the wheel and say, you know, I need to take over now because I know what's best here. So look at the opportunities, you know, that you're giving your child, um, you know, when do you take the wheel? Um, you know, when do they really need you to step in and help? And when can you step back and let give them a little bit of control? And so how can we help young people understand that life is not purely random? We want our kids to know that they have power to control the outcomes in their lives. And where can we find areas to give youth um, a little bit of control who so often feel out of control of their surroundings and circumstances? I know that was a lot of C's, so I'm gonna to try to wrap them all up together now. So we really want to notice and reinforce a young person's competence we want to build confidence in a youth's competence. We wanna foster the vital connection between adult and youth. We wanna develop character in a sense of contribution, develop the critical coping strategies that will help a young person thrive even through difficult times, and help a student gain control by learning that the privileges they earn are linked to the responsibility they demonstrate. So I don't know how many of you like to do puzzles. I don't really love them to be honest, but my seven-year-old does. And she's learned, of course, the best way to do it is to you know, lay out the border pieces, make the border first, and then she sets up the picture on the box and she uses that to help her do the rest. Well, that's really what we wanna do with our kids. And so Dr. Ginsburg says, boundaries are monitoring, boundaries in monitoring create those borders students can push against as they work on the harder inner pieces on their own. When we serve as healthy role models, we offer youth a reliable picture on the cover. Adolescents with appropriate boundaries and trustworthy role models can navigate the rest on their own. So as we wrap up this morning, just remember, don't be like me, don't be the helicopter. Helicopter parenting does not allow kids much independence. It takes the helicopter parent takes too much responsibility for a child's experiences. They don't allow for natural exploration and growth, um, and they overprotect and overperfect. So instead, let's leave here as a guiding light for our kids. Let's be lighthouse parents. So the lighthouse parent allows for independence and growth. The lighthouse sets the right kind of high expectations. They're protective, but not overprotective, and they nurture those coping skills, helping their, their children to learn how to bounce back. And so I hope that was helpful, but I want us all to remember that all people, even strong, the most strong and resilient, reach their limits sometimes, and that is not a sign of weakness. And so if you live with or work with a child who is not coping well, we need to stop, we need to notice, we need to take it seriously, and we need to take some steps to help um, help them get some help. So I wanna give you a few resources um, just in case you need some extra support. Well, this is Dr. Kenneth Ginsburg. He's the creator of the seven C's. He has a website, fosteringresilience.com. It has tons of resources for parents and for teachers along with links to books he has written. So if you want more information on building resilience, this could be a great place to start. And then we actually at the foundation have a website called hereprotexas.com. And it's actually a searchable online database of Texas mental health providers. Um, and there are over 900 providers um, listed on um, our website. And you can be very specific with what you're looking for and really filter it down to the age of the child, um, you know, what specific um, help you're needing, uh, if you have insurance or what insurance you have, what your zip code is, um, and it will find a specific list of resources tailored um, just for you. But if that seems too overwhelming or you aren't quite sure what you're looking for or where to begin, you can also call our mental health navigation line. 
a trained volunteer will actually take your call and um, talk to you, gather all the information. They will pass that on to a licensed social worker who again will tailor a list of resources just for you. And then they'll follow up with you to make sure that you found the help that you're needing. And then of course, a number we all hope we will never have to call, but one um, to be sure to have in your phone is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Um, you can call for yourself or someone else. Um, and it actually uses GPS um, if you call from your cell phone to connect you to a crisis counselor um, in your area. And then this is a great um, resource for teens um, or children old enough to have a phone. There is now a crisis text line, which is great because we know that our teens are much more likely to text than to make a phone call. So I actually tried this out. Um, I made sure to let them know I was not um, in distress, but I was amazed at how quickly they responded um, and how warm and how helpful they were. So this is a great resource to have saved to your phone as well. Um, if you do have questions, you're, you can uh, feel free to email me at jessica at granthalliburton.org. Um, um, you can also you know, follow us on social media or check out our website. We have a lot of great um, parent resources there as well. Great, th great, thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, very useful information. I think that um, I really have learned a lot here. Um, thank you all so much for having me. And let's see, let oh. me let me share my screen. Can y'all see my screen? Let's see. Okay, let me take this photo out the way. Okay, so I have put Holly Vasquez information. Um, Holly was the first presenter and um, she's our counseling and family engagement coordinator. If you should have any questions, please reach out to Holly. Um, she will be more than happy to help you, assist you in, um, in any resources that you might need. Next month, um, we will be having Proyecto Inmigrante um, do a presentation for us on Zoom on Wednesday, November the 10th from 5 to 6 p.m. Um, this is for anyone that might be interested in becoming a U.S. citizen or um, they just want to know how to apply for a residency. Um, this is open to the community. Um, you can um, give the link to anyone that might be interested. I'm sure that they will start putting this information on our website and um, on our Blackboard um, notices as well. Um, also, we'll be having Life After TBP High School Readiness. That will be, um, the English session will be November 16, and the Spanish on November 17 from 5 to 6 p.m. In this session, if you have an eighth grader, um, I would say do not miss this um, topic. We will be giving out very valuable information like um, come and learn um, what high schools are out there, how to apply. And the most important um, thing is deadlines. All these um, high schools have deadlines. So that's very important for you to be aware of that information. So please join us. And um, if you know of someone that has an eighth grader that did not join us this morning, please let them know that this is, uh, we'll be having this. Um, also, again, this will be in your newsletter, Blackboard, and um, the our website. Laura, do you have anything that um, you would like to add on? 
Um, yeah, I just want to let parents know um, for any of those parents that are wondering how do I receive the TVP newsletter or I haven't been receiving those, um, those are sent to you um, through your email. So make sure you log into Skyward to verify the email that you have in your account. Um, these TVP newsletters are sent every Monday morning um, to your email, whatever email we have on file for you. Um, <clears throat> so the both of the upcoming Zooms um, in November will be on the newsletter and we will also be posting it on our Facebook page for Trinity Basin Preparatory. So parents, if you have Facebook, make sure you follow Trinity Basin Preparatory so you can get any updated posts on any of the Zoom meetings we have or just overall what's going on with um, Trinity Basin Preparatory as a district. Um, thank you so much for being here this morning. We are happy that you were here. Hopefully this information was very, very helpful for you and your students. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to Ms. Vasquez, uh, Ms. Gomez or myself. Um, on our website, we also have um, a specific tab for Perry University with all of our information and then upcoming topics and topics that we have had in the past. Um, so you can also visit our website as a reference for anything that's related to Perrin University with TBP. Um, thank you so much for being here, and we hope to see you here um, next month in November. Um, Ms. Gomez, I think that's all for me. Not sure if you have any other announcements. No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you to everyone that joined us. Um, Jessica, Ms. Luck, thank you so much for being a part of this event. And also to Ms. Um, Holly Vasquez, thank you for your support.